Courtney. All right, so so in the place of Paul York, who was supposed to be giving this presentation, I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be speaking today on on uh, climate ethics, uh, veganism. The question is the future vegan. The importance of this climate vegan campaign that we have started, and uh, I'm going to be be talking about how animal rights intersects with environmental justice. So before so in, so to begin, I'll. I'll, yeah, I'll start with the question of how, like, if this anthropocentric worldview, which includes speciesism and the idea that nature exists purely for our purposes and has no intrinsic value, and that we we should use technology to achieve these ends, and that we we shouldn't we shouldn't apply an ethical analysis to technology. The idea of technology is a kind of end in itself. If this is what led to climate change in the first place, then how can we, how can we imagine that we will mitigate this disaster uh, while still relying upon that framework? Like how, like if the, if this framework got us here in the first place, then how can we possibly, possibly, possibly want to preserve, want to preserve this framework and not expect like a disaster to happen again or a very similar one to happen, to to happen again? When I think that's what's very dangerous is this attitude that we can only we can only think about mitigating climate change and speak about mitigating climate change if there is there are economic economic costs associated with not mitigating it and and we can and we can only we can only think think about mitigating climate change because we want to perpetuate this this neoliberal capitalist future that will be threatened by these disasters because if we're approaching the end of the world, then how can we possibly imagine that capitalism will continue somehow? That we can keep doing things the way we're doing. So, so I'll begin. I'll begin with that. It's very important that we imagine a norm normative future because because if we think that we should only mitigate climate change so that we can keep things going the way they've always been going, that's that's such a, a lack of imagination and. And then, and, and that means that we see no intrinsic value in nature in things apart from how we can use them. That we're addicted to this idea that things things only have value as an ends for human means. The Catholic mystic Thomas Berry he describes us as living in this addiction to use, where we can, we can only see things as valuable in so far as we can turn them into commodities, which is what we've done with the extra human world. The other thing is that the, the the climate justice and environmental justice movements, as they currently exist, are very speciesist. Uh, they still they still see humans as the most important, and they see see mitigating climate change as important because for, because of the pre preservation of humanity. Uh, other animals don't really factor into it for them. For a lot of people in climate justice and environmental justice. Uh, it's humans that are at the pinnacle and humans that we need to be concerned about. So, uh, in a conversation I had with Paul Waldo, he said, well, like, just think about how people will say, oh, I'm scared about climate change because what about my children? Like, what, what, what are our children going to face? Uh, e even though it's a sentiment that a lot of us who have children have felt, uh, that still shows that we're scared primarily for us, and like our the, the scope of who's affected by this for us has not ventured very far beyond the human, and and I, I think that we need we need to desperately start looking beyond the human and see how how all life on Earth is affected because because for example the World Wildlife Fund has estimated that forty percent of animals have died out since 1970, and and. Uh, Scholars who study mass extinctions have predicted that another 50% of all life on Earth will die out by the year 2100 if we do nothing fast to mitigate climate change. So that's a good 85 to 90% of all species gone. That that's generally the the rate at which species die in a typical mass extinction. But but the problem is that this is caused by one species, and we've done it in the space of a few centuries, which is which is totally awful. Yeah. 
Something that's interesting is that Paul developed this presentation as a response to uh, a professor at U of T who wrote a paper that, in which she said that the future is not vegan. This is another problem that comes up in the climate justice and environmental justice movements. Like, for example, uh, Bill McKibben of 350.org, he, he believes in, in climate justice, he, be he believes in environmental justice, but he's a speciesist, he's for grass-fed beef, for example. He thinks that that's a sustainable solution to the problems that we're facing. So, so you can see that the idea that we should be concerned primarily for humans is still very strong there. Yeah, and, and it's a problem we often come across, like this idea that locavore use of animals is somehow still sustainable. However, however, like this is part, even though this is seen as an alternative for, peop for people who don't want to be part of the system, this really isn't the case because uh, as I'm sure many of us in this room know, uh, grass-fed beef can be even more environmentally destructive than the conventional counterpart because of the deforestation involved and, and the, land, the land use involved. And uh, even though this is seen as a, a way out, a sustainable alternative, we can see that the factory, the huge factory farming corporations and the fast food chains also are also very interested in this and have seen this as a means to their own purposes. Uh, for example, the Global Conference on Sustainable Beef, which was, which was uh, sponsored by enormous factory farming corporations like Cargill and it was sponsored by McDonald's as well. Even though this is seen as environmentally friendly and seen as an alternative for us to get way of, uh, for, uh, for people who want to be alternative to get out of the awful capitalist system, like you can, you can see that it's an alt it's a meaningless choice that's been constructed by the industry, and you can see that it's a meaningless choice that's been that's been constructed by the ind industry. It's an example of pure greenwashing. So what so what can we do in response to this? Uh, in his paper, uh, Pushing Environmental Justice to Its Natural Limit, Paul Waldo says, he, he states that, that uh, environmental justice activists who refuse to take into account non-human animals in any way other than as a means to human ends, he, com he compares that type of thinking to, to, for example, 19th century socialists who, despite being very progressive, they didn't see women's rights as part of their as they didn't see women's rights as, as part of as, as part of their platform they that that didn't matter ethically ethically to them so we need an intersectional analysis intersectionality it's a term that's used a lot in social justice studies where we have to see how different types of oppression how, how different pr types of oppression are interlocking how they they underlie each other for, for example like how how like a racialized woman, for example, like the experience of racism underlies, uh, that underpins sexism as well, and the experience of sex or sexism underpins racism. You can't, you can't really separate it, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Paul Waldo, he, he says that it's an irony that we have these ideas that are supposedly to be extended to, to all of us universally. For, for example, the idea of universal rights, the idea of equality, but but we still end up leaving leaving certain beings out of that. He compares this to environmental racism. Uh, for 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 example, how uh, industries that pollute are often placed in poor com poor communities of color. For example, slaughterhouses and factory farms are often placed in poor communities of color, and the logic behind it is that uh, people of color don't have the same right to a clean environment that's safe as uh, rich white folks do, for example. And, and uh, Waldo thinks that we can start talking about environmental justice activists who don't, who don't believe in animal rights. We can talk about them as environmental speciesists, where they, think, they believe that, in principle, all of, us should all of us have the right to a clean, safe environment. All, all of us have the right to, to flourish within our environment, to take a term that ecofeminists use, but then at the same time, yeah, but but then at the same time, they think that animals have they don't have that right, whereas humans do. 
But as you can see, this contradicts itself because this is supposed to be this is supposed to be universal ideal. This is supposed to impl imply to uh, apply to everyone. So, so, so the idea is that we must shift from this this anthropocentric view of nature in which humanity is the pinnacle. Uh, this this idea that the rest of nature is for the instrumental use by human beings, this was exacerbated significantly by the Enlightenment and by the Industrial Revolution, absolute catastrophe, but, but we also see traces of this in, uh, in, in a lot of world religions, for example, like the idea that humanity is supposed to have dominion. So, so Thomas Berry talks about shifting away from that worldview to a, what he calls a biocentric worldview, in which, in which, uh, Humanity is not seen as the pinnacle. Like humanity is just seen as a small part of a web of life, for example, to use that metaphor. And yeah, and he says that in order to make this shift, we have to harness uh, what he calls the full, the full, the four pillars of society. He talks about education, about uh, businesses, about religious institute institutions about governments and like how they, they all have to be a part of this and this is what we're doing with the climate vegan campaign like we want all of these institutions to be a part of it and uh, and we're trying to bridge environmental justice and animal rights like uh, Paul Waldo he, he describes the the breach between the environmental justice movement and the animal rights movement as uh, the tire the tyranny of small differences we have to get over that. We have to see that these movements actually have a lot in common. Yeah. There, there is an ideology that can be referred to as corporatism. Uh, in his paper, The Religion of the Market, which I like a lot, David Loy talks about how he's how capitalism for him is the most successful religion on earth. It is adhered to like a religion. It even promises a form of salvation. The idea that if you buy more and more, uh, you can be happy. He describes it as the most successful religion on earth. Uh, in religious studies, we use the term syncretism to describe uh, religions that merge with each other. So, so for example, uh, Christianity, Christianity, like merging with Celtic paganism in Europe, for example, or uh, Tibetan Buddhism being emer emerging of, of Buddhism when it came to Tibet with uh, pre-existing beliefs in the region. And, and Loy's argument is that capitalism has merged similarly with every religion on earth, and is, it kind of spreads parasitically for him. It's the, it can be said to be the most successful religion and, uh, I mean, in the sheer dedication that we see from extremely committed capitalists to their ideology, uh, we can see that they, they see it as a kind of ultimate purpose, something that they have to absolutely dedicate themselves to at all costs. And, and for them, and, and for them, uh, we can see, like, this, this idea of, oh, every, so we have to get all the oil to every last drop of oil, we have to go to that extreme, like no matter how how uh, bizarre and like how invasive the procedures for getting that oil are, we have to do it at all costs. Uh, that's that's a very extreme form of, of dedication. Like it's the basically being so dedicated to a certain ideology that you're unable to imagine a future. You're you're made in, unable to imagine a future without it. You that that's just. There are no compromises possible. That uh, it has to be, it has to be perpetuated at all costs, and and uh, to to lose that, to yeah, and that uh, that to to lose to lose that to suggest alternatives to capitalism that would be dangerous for a very devoted capitalist because because it would put humanity into a kind of, or at least the most devoted capitalists, into a kind of anime. That's a term that was coined, coined, coined by Emile Durkheim and uh, Peter Berger takes up, where what it means is, like, it's a form, it's, an, it's a feeling of, of floating, of having lost something that your life revolves around, like having, uh, like, everything's up for grabs, of there being no, 
there being no under underlying meaning, everything being fragmented. So, so like this is a feeling that's so devastating that we've seen that like often people will choose death over that feeling. For example, uh, the end of the end of World War II in Berlin, uh, thousands of people committed suicide because they couldn't imagine the world without the Nazi regime. They this thing that they had poured so much into, like it just it just uh, it had ruined their country and uh, it had caused un unimaginable destruction and like people couldn't cope with the idea that this thing they had dedicated so much to like had ruined everything for them. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go over uh, James Garvey's the, the Ethics of Climate Change a bit. Uh, equity and Basic Rights, uh, the argument for marginal cases, I'm sure a lot of us have, have heard about that, like the idea that animals should have rights because most of us, most of us think that that for, that for example, uh, infants or severely mentally disabled people, even though they, they show us that uh, your cognitive capacities do not determine whether you're, you are a morally cons considerable subject or not, and the same can be applied to, to animals, like even if, I mean, if a, if a mentally disabled orphan should matter to us ethically, uh, there's no reason why animals shouldn't matter ethically to us as, as well. Three types of rights, negative, positive, community rights. Uh, negative, I think negative rights are, are like freedom from things like, like for example, like, for, like freedom from, from torture, like prolonged suffering, death. Positive rights are rights to, rights to like food, water, like able to, ability to move and so on. Uh, key concepts: universe, universality, equality. That, that's what I. That's what I was talking about earlier when I was uh, discussing Paul Waldo's essay and uh, the irony of of believing in in these universal principles but not applying them to a particular group for arbitrary reasons. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go over James Garvey's ethics of climate change a bit. In this book, he proposes that that to to he he proposes that we fail to extend uh, moral consideration to members of future generations. But he sees this as a very pivotal thing, especially when discussing climate change, because like often people will seem disconnected from the issue because. Uh, they'll think, oh, that they're they're burning fossil fuels, driving their Hummer, or they're eating a burger, but it doesn't seem to affect anyone directly. Like they, they can't see they can't see the violence happening in that. It's something that's more dissipated. That's the term, that's the way Garvey describes it. It's something that's dissipated across space and time. Like you don't see, I don't know, like for example, a, a child in Bangladesh drowning in a few decades when you drive your Hummer or you eat your burger, even though that is a consequence of that, uh, it's very it's very hard for people to see to understand like that violence can be indirect. Like we just we don't want to acknowledge that at all. It's a it's kind of mental block. And uh, and uh, Garvey says that in order to to mitigate climate change, like a big part of it is realizing that future generations should be should be ethically considered by us as well that, that they have that they that they have rights so so that's uh, expanding our sphere of moral consideration to its natural limits and the same is with animals as well yeah so so this presentation deals a lot with deontological ethics uh, which is the idea that we should do we should do what we know is right, even if it will bring us no good consequences. That's opposed to utilitarianism, for example, which which revolves around the idea that uh, evil means are justified if they bring us good ends. So, example for, for for example, like a violent uprising would be justified if it creates uh, a more egalitarian and just society. Uh, whereas deontological ethics, like for con Immanuel Kant, for example, like he's the, the philosopher who who started that idea pretty much. It's the idea that you should you should just always obey your conscience regardless of what consequences it brings you and and like if it 
if you do the right thing, and even if absolutely nothing good happens, you can't change anything. Like, you're basically a martyr, so what? <laughs> yeah, so, so for example, like a thought experiment that we can use to, to think about this would be, I mean, this is a bit, a bit extreme, but like imagining that you're in a death camp during World War II, so what are you going to do? Are you going to choose to, to go out and not betray your con your conscience and to retain a sense of dignity? Are you going to behave decently towards other human beings? Are you not going to be uh, complicit in murder to extend your own life a bit or to to have extra food? Uh, for for example, like, like you wouldn't you wouldn't want to be one of the the Sonder Commando, which was the the group that would uh, be complicit in the murder of fellow inmates. They they would. They, they would assist in uh, gassing them and then burning them after. You, you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to be like that because the point is to not betray your conscience at, at all costs. And I think this is a bit comparable to what we're seeing now with climate change because even if, I mean, the, the absolute worst case scenario that James Hansen describes is that, uh, is that uh, the methane vents within the oceans are disrupted are disrupted, and there's a positive feedback loop, and uh, it leads to the extinction of all life on Earth. There's a Venus effect. That, that idea came from, uh, from, uh, from studies of Venus that show that the planet used to be a lot more lush than it is now. Now it's a hot, dry wasteland. And the fear is that in the absolute worst case scenario, a similar thing could happen to Earth. So, and, and I mean, like, even if it doesn't get, get that extreme, I, I talked to Danny Harvey recently, and he says that he, he doesn't think it could get that extreme, but, like, even if the absolute worst-case scenario doesn't happen, there's still going to be widespread destruction, and, I mean, these industries don't show any sign of slowing down yet at all, and uh, considering that there is a time lag, uh, the oceans take time to warm, so the effects that we're causing now might not be seen for a few more decades. Uh, so, so consider, considering, considering all that, uh, I mean, even if the absolute worst case scenario doesn't happen, the, what we're going to see is still going to be extreme and very disastrous. Uh, there's going to be wars, like there's going to be massive flooding, massive droughts, uh, pandemics probably, and so, like, the idea is that, that even if we are compromised so much, and like, even if what we do doesn't really amount to very much in the end. The, the idea is that we have a, we have a duty to, to mitigate climate change and we can't compromise that at all costs. <laughs> yeah, so, so James Garvey, he raises the question of animal rights and human chauvinism or speciesism, so he acknowledges that at all. He talks about ex that's part of his project of expanding this, the sphere of moral considerability and adopting new values that we must do in order to mitigate climate change. He talks about extending moral consideration to future generations as well. And uh, he, he talks about, uh, he makes the distinction between instrumental value and intrinsic value as well, uh, which is, that's a very Kantian idea. Uh, Kant's uh, famous formula of humanity is, which which can be argued can be extended to the other animals as well, is that you should never treat anyone as a means to an end, but always as an end in themselves. So, so, what, so the way Garvey takes this up is that, is that we have to see other creatures as having value in, in and of themselves, instead, instead of like seeing them purely in terms of the value they have insofar as they can be used by human beings. And uh, this is seen as vital for mitigating climate change, be we, because if we consider, if, if we continue to see nature only as useful and uh, only as valuable in terms of how it can be used by humans, then uh, that, legitim that legitimizes human domination, and we're going to we're going to inevitably see the same disasters. And there's there's no way that it, anything is going to be prevented. So it's an it's this idea that we have to adopt radically different values in order to confront the crisis that we're facing. Uh, that's 
that Thomas Berry has a very similar vision as do as do many uh, thinkers uh, in environmental justice and ecofeminists who combine uh, environmental justice and feminism and look at the connection between misogyny and the destruction of the environment. Yeah, anthropocentrism versus biocentrism, Thomas Berry. Also the, the land ethic, uh, the Leopold, that's, an, that's another idea regarding uh, ethical consideration of nature as well. Yeah. Yeah, so responsibility, I covered this a bit. Like even though even though the consequences of our bad decisions are spread out over over time, like we still have to see those actions as violent. Another idea is corrective justice, the, because, and this extends from the fact that uh, the the parts of the world that are least responsible for climate change are the ones that are going to be affected the worst by climate change in the coming years. So, so that would be mostly the global south, and and also and also the Arctic. So, so really the the parts of the world that haven't had very much influence upon the climate are going to be are going to be going to be affected the worst and the idea is that the burden of mitigating climate change should fall on the developed world because we're for the most part responsible for it it's uh, James Garvey argues that it's only fair another important issue to address is technological solutions and climate change uh, in his book uh, the end of ethics in a technological society Lawrence E Schmidt he says he says that uh, technology is seen by our culture as a kind of end in itself. It's become it's become almost a taboo to critique technology. Uh, he talks about what he calls the technological imperative, where where uh, if you can techno technologize something even more, like that's unquestionably good. More technology is unquestionably good. Even though that isn't always the case, we assume that technology isn't ideological. We assume that technology is always neutral. And how this ties into climate change is that we've often seen proposed solutions for climate change uh, that are that are basically technological band-aids. Uh, for for example, like geoengineering would be one. Uh, the idea of putting massive mirrors in space or putting particles of sulfur in the atmosphere as a way of as a way of cooling down the, the planet, or carbon sequestration, like the idea that uh, car carbon ha can be stored in uh, pits deep, deep within the, the Earth. Uh, even though that's never been try tried very much, and and we don't know what the consequences of that are, like that's, that's a problem with these technological solutions, is that we come up with them and we think that it's a good idea, but, but like these can have unforeseen consequences, they're often very dangerous. Uh, so, so it's like it's comparable to nuclear energy, for example, because even though even though a lot of environmentalists see nuclear energy as clean, it has it has like really really hideous consequences if you think about, and it'll affect uh, many future generations, and it's it's a it can be seen as a really irresponsible thing for that reason. Yeah, and it's also, it's very, it's a very pessimistic mindset that our only hope lies in these technological solutions. Uh, they are, they are totally ideological because it is a way of deflecting attention away from, from actually changing our material conditions and imagining alternatives to this uh, parasitic uh, capitalist model that devours everything in, in sight. It's it's really, I, it's I mean it's very telling that often, uh, often like corporations are big proponents of these technological solutions because the idea is okay sure we can burn all the coal oil and gas and that's fine uh, technology will save us in the end. Uh, I mean in this, it's in this extreme form like this would be like ideas that we can uh, 
we can terraform Mars, for example, and we can just escape and live in a pod on Mars, which is completely ridiculous. But if you talk to some people, they, they really do believe that. And, and regarding the animal issue, an example of this would be, would be, for example, would be uh, the, the EnviroPig, which was developed by Guelph, a university of Guelph. Uh, it's a, a Yorkshire pig that has been genetically, genetically modified. It, it's a Yorkshire pig that has, uh, that has been uh, genetically, genetically, uh, Modified as a, a response to uh, pollution of water by by fact, by intensive farming, and they just they just re totally redesign redesign the the pig's body, and that deflects attention away from the animals and away from the real cause of the problem, which is people like breeding these animals to consume them, and uh, it puts the blame on the pig. It doesn't put the blame on the system. It doesn't put a blame on speciesism. So what's really needed is behavioral change, and this is what we're trying to do with the, the Climate Vegan campaign. And uh, this isn't to put the emphasis completely on behavioral change. One problem is that a lot of climate justice-minded justice, justice -minded people, even, even Naomi Klein said this, which I think is completely ridiculous. She said that veganism isn't shouldn't be seen as a solution because uh, because that's behavioral change and we should be focusing on structural change, i.e. changing the structure of society rather than these, these behavioral changes like uh, making different consumer choices uh, on an ethical basis. <laughs> Where did she say that? Uh, she said it on uh, an I am on Reddit. Yeah, she, she said that because she said that it's wrong to put the emphasis on veganism because that's focusing too much on behavioral change when she's all for structural change. But often, as we've seen before, behavioral and structural change are interlinked. Well, sure. I mean, the whole world was vegan, some structures would change. Uh, what a ridiculous Exactly. Point and, like, for mean, example, like, somewhere we could start, like, on a structural level is not subsidizing all the animal products. Like, that, sure. would, be, that would be somewhere to start because that's a structural change and that is, in, that is linked with behavioral change as well. And I mean, we do we do live in a society in which we are coerced to some degree to to do violent things, and uh, and like we we live in a society that is so completely saturated by structural tr structural violence that if you go to the store and buy something, uh, there chances are like some like really hideous violence went into that. So often, for that reason, people will say that we don't we don't have agency, but then. Denying that people can make different choices and denying that people can change behaviors is a way of saying that is based is a way of removing agency from the person. So, so even though like I do agree that we should be focusing on structural change, uh, we should be focusing on on changing uh, the structure of society. Like I think I think capitalism should be gotten rid of personally. Uh, I'm I'm very I'm very I'm very opposed to it. Uh, but yeah, so so. Like even though I do think we should be, we should be focusing on, on it to to ignore behavioral change is a is a huge flaw. Uh, I think part of the the challenge for us in mitigating climate change is that uh, the powers that be have focused for for so long on uh, these individual moralistic solutions. Uh, Garvey talks about this uh, in in his book a bit as to do other. Climate ethicists like and uh, Al Gore is often blamed for advocating this sort of thing. The idea of oh, so you have to switch your light bulbs, you, you have to take shorter sh showers, and so on. It's a collection of like frivolous ideas that uh, do do nothing to affect the structure of society. And often these these are pop these solutions are popular because because it doesn't question capitalism. It doesn't question these paradigms that we've been brought up to believe are neutral and will always exist. Yeah, so so where would veganism fit into that? Some people would lump veganism together with that, even though it's a far more extreme change than that, and it's a change that is, and a lifestyle choice that is very unpopular in the society, as believing in animal rights is very, very unpopular. But at the same time, it's uh, it's wrong to deny that behavioral changes are important. I think that 
over the coming over the coming cent century. Regardless of whether we believe that animal rights are not uh, due to massive water shortages, as we know, animal agriculture is extremely water intensive. Uh, people, more, more and more people, even if they don't necessarily believe in animal rights, are going to be adopting vegetarianism and veganism. We already saw this with Danny Harvey, who was the first first person to sign the the climate vegan contract. He he's a vegan now. Who you made up a contract? Uh, yeah, uh, me and Anita Crimes and Polly Oh, great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, and Danny Harvey was the first to to sign it because uh, he's a climate scientist at U of T, and he's just notice noticing that uh, the issue of animal agriculture is completely unavoidable now. Uh, a worry is that. A worry is that is that if meat eating continues and the world does not become vegan, then many people might starve or go without water as a consequence of, of uh, animals being bred to feed the rich. So there's a lot of class injustice there as well. So it's the it. Currently, it's thought that by the mid the middle of the century, most people will be will be forced to become vegetarian or vegan or to face starvation. Um, we already see this uh, happening with the the dairy industry in Cal in California, for example. And uh, I mean, like we've seen this with with the price of bacon going up, for example, where where the industry is suffering because of the problems that are caused by that industry, because of the environmental devastation caused by that industry. And uh, in California, 50% of water goes to animal agriculture. Really yeah, my battery's running low. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just I'll just keep going regardless. Yeah, some climate justice issues said North South South inequity, climate racism, the risk to future generations, the risks posed by technological solutions, expanding the definition of climate justice to include non-human animals adversely affected by climate change. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the problem. So. So the problem with uh, the way we view ethics, or lack thereof, in the society is that there is this addiction to this utilitarian calculus. Uh, it's very local. We don't think about the future. The future generation might as well be expendable for our short-term economic gain. Sure, just a minute. Sorry about that. It's a, it's always a cost benefit benefit analysis. The the, the idea that uh, we just need to weigh weigh the pros and the cons, and uh, and if and uh, we can see that this isn't value neutral because if it serves human ends, then it's always legitimized, and we see that with with animals and. Uh, and also we see that when things serve the purpose of the market, regardless of the costs involved, uh, that is always seen as okay if things, uh, if things create economic, if, pl if projects create economic gain. It also completely avoids the idea of universal rights. It, it's a, a worldview, a worldview in which uh, the rights of individuals do not matter. So, so uh, with the animal question, for example, uh, exploitation of animals is seen as is seen as fine because it, it is seen as fine because it's thought that the gain for humans is more important than the cost to the animal, but the rights of the animal are completely ignored. Critics of technological sustainability. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's uh, Lauren Schmidt's book, The End of Ethics in a Technological Society. Risk calculations is morally questionable. Uh, for example, nuclear power. Uh, 
also Sigmund Bauman, he said that he said that cost benefits analysis are a way of reducing reducing ethics to a kind of gambling where where whoever bargains the most wins and and uh, ethics doesn't ethics doesn't really seem to, to factor in, into it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Urs Ursula Franklin also wrote a really great critique of technology in which she she contrasted uh, she contrasted uh, nuclear power in forms of high technology with uh, with low technology and talked about intermediate forms of technology so uh, she she is really critical of technology that uh, technology that has to be broken up into different parts in order for people to use and uh, is too is too complicated for an individual person to understand uh, she contrasts that with uh, with something that's more holistic where uh, one person is in control of the process from the beginning to the end and can understand it uh, so that's very that's very similar to Marx's idea of alienation and uh, his contrasting of alienated labor with unalienated labor uh, in one you're in control of the finished product from start to end and in another it's broken up and you're more on an assembly line uh, and in intermediate technology would be coming between that, for example, uh, windmills as opposed to nuclear power generation. And this comes back to my discussion of deontological ethics earlier, because because if we if we believe that uh, consequences shouldn't factor into it, and we believe that we should we should always do what is right regardless, then these types of technological solutions, which are based on cost-benefit analysis and in utilitarianism, they're, they're not an acceptable solution. And that's the, the, the Faustian bargain. Uh, James, James Hansen describes us as being in a Faustian bargain uh, where we've, we've effectively sold our soul, souls to the devil like Faust does in in order to dedicate or de devote ourselves to this idea of of perpetual of perpetual economic gain of perpetual economic progress, uh, yeah, this is this is a quote from James Hansen. Just as Doctor Faustus, after enjoying the fruits of his dreams, was eventually dragged off to Hades with fearful shrieking. So too, humanity, after enjoying the economic fruits of fossil fuels, may be dragged to its doom. Unfortunately, the people suffering such a fearful fate will be future generations and all life on this planet, rather than the parties who made the bargain with the devil. Yeah, that's a picture of his grandson. I, I think this quote is quite powerful. Jake has not done much of anything to cause global warming. He doesn't even walk yet. He crawls fast. I interrupted one of his crawls when I called him to look up so I could snap this picture. My parents lived about 90 years, so Jake will probably be around most of the century, who will live in the greenhouse world that we choose to create. Uh, James Hansen says that, says that hopefully in the future, uh, the fossil fuel corporations, and, and we would add the, the factory farming corporations as well, will be put before will be put before an international tribunal like the Nuremberg trials and will be uh, will be charged with uh, crimes against nature and crimes against humanity. I think that's quite hopeful. Uh, I, but I think it's quite optimistic, but I hope it does happen. <laughs> the issue of environmental fascism. In his book, The Case for Animal Rights, Tom Reagan out, outlines this concept. This, this is another problem that needs to be dealt with in bridging the animal rights and environmental justice communities, uh, there is a tendency in environmental justice to flatten animals into the environment and to just see animals as part of the environment rather than individuals in their own rights. So, so like this leads to attitudes that, that will justify the instrumental use of animals for some purposes because the, the idea is that the species is more important than the individual animal and that uh, 
some animals are expendable, if the species is, has a stable population, then some of those animals are expendable for, for human purposes. Uh, we also see this with uh, quote-unquote invasive species as well, where the killing of some animals is justified because uh, because they're not indigenous to a region or because they're seen as causing destruction. However, I think that this can I think that this can be bridged because because uh, we, for example, we we're, we're, we are individuals in our own right, but we're also part of the environment as well, and we're not separable from the environment. I mean, we evolved as animals in nature, and, and we can see that with the other animals as, as well. And, and I mean, if we want, and as Paul Waldo says, if we want to, we want to help individual animals, we want to see individ communities of individual animals flourish, we have to create the conditions that those communities need to live in, to live in in the beginning. So Paul Waldo, uh, when he talked last week, he used the example of orcas, where, say, if you love orcas and are really concerned with orcas, then you want to preserve the environments that allow orcas living in their communities to be possible. And, and the, same, the same can happen as well. Because I, I mean, a lot of a lot of people in environmental justice, they're halfway there because they already see uh, extra human nature as having value apart from human use, and they they they're critical of this this idea that extra human nature is valuable and in, only insofar as it can be used by humans. So so they're so they're almost there, but they they dismiss the individual animals. But that that is a way to to start to care about the individual animals themselves. The moral law in the context of climate change. The way we save the world is at least as important as the fact of saving it. The means and end should be consistent. It makes no sense to save future generations by putting those who are currently alive at risk when non-risk alternatives exist. This goes back to not using people as a means to an end. Uh, while some, well, while some would argue that, say, technological solutions are justified because, like, even if, though they cause some harm, uh, the net gain is positive. Also, the idea of viol a violent uprising, like some people believe that that we should have a, a violent uprising against the, the powers that be because otherwise the world's going to boil. And uh, we've seen this argument in the past, like the, the who would have stopped Hitler argument, for example. But, but that's also using hum other human beings as a means to an end. Uh, and it's contradictory because the ends and means could, should be consistent. And if we care so much about human beings in the future, then it doesn't make sense to dispose of other human beings now or potentially cause harm to other human beings and animals as well. Yeah. I, w I would like to add that I would also like to discuss the idea of the no-growth economy uh, and how this intersects with the climate vegan movement. Uh, for example, uh, Tim Jackson, in his book Prosperity Without Growth, he says that he proposes this idea of uh, an economy that is steady state, that doesn't need economic growth, a, a less materialistic society that that will enhance life satisfaction, as he put it. A more equal society will lower the importance of status goods. A less growth-driven economy will improve people's work-life balance. Enhanced investment in public goods will provide lasting returns to the nation's prosperity. The, the idea that flourishing within limits is a real possibility and that there's no need to colonize other parts of the world uh, very violently in order to expand markets for commodities and uh, exploit all possible sources of com commodities. So, so the question is, should this be part of this climate vegan campaign? Uh, I, I would argue that since all of these issues are interconnected, uh, 
challenging this paradigm of, paradigm of endless economic growth is, it is necessary as, as all these issues are interconnected. However, one might ask if that's, if that might be seen as capitalism without capitalism, uh, it could be seen as a euphemism for, so, for socialism, uh, because uh, some would argue that capitalism at its core has this need to, to expand markets in whatever violent way possible. And so is a steady state economy uh, just getting rid of the core of capitalism but preserving some cosmetic features of the system? Yeah, so, uh, so I think it's basically socialism. Yeah, there's James Hansen's quote about uh, the CEOs of fossil fuel, fossil energy companies, how they should, they should be tried for high crimes against humanity and nature. One thing that I would like to add in this presentation is that we need to, we need to humble ourselves. We need to see ourselves as part of the environment and understand that we are animals in nature. It's, a, it's really a massive blow to the human ego, as Freud would put it. Freud talked about three, three, three important blows to the human ego uh, that happened in the history of European science. The first was the Copernican Revolution, the idea that, uh, the, the, idea that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, it's the other way around. Uh, the reason that was challenged so much by the church is because it, it was basically saying that we're not special, we're not at the center of the universe, and uh, the the earth is what could be one of many planets and many solar systems that support life. The second was the idea of evolution. Darwin understood that human beings are not superior to other animals and that human beings are animals as a type. There are no hierarchies in evolution if someone believes that there are hierarchies in evolution and that humanity is at the top of the evolutionary scale. That's, that's completely wrong. Dar Darwin didn't believe that at all. It's, it's more of a, you have to think of it as a kind of bush of life rather than a tree of life. And, that, and that's what people who study evolutionary biology are finding out more and more. The, the third blow uh, Freud thought was his own idea of the unconscious, the idea that we are driven by things that are not necessarily rational at many times, and, and, and that uh, most of our mental life does not take place on the conscious level, that that, that is just a blip, that is just, uh, that is just something on, on the surface, like the tip of the iceberg. And what he means by that, I think, is that we are animals of a, so of a sort psychologically as well, that that there is, there is that uh, animal kernel within us, and that in many ways we will, we will always be animals. And uh, I think Paul Waldo expresses this very poetically when he says, you know, we can know a lot about what it means to be an animal by just looking at ourselves, because we are animals. Uh, all of the things that we cherish about ourselves are animal qualities as well. So. So I would uh, contend that climate change can be seen as the very last blow to the human ego because it shows us very viscerally like just how vulnerable we are, like a few degrees more and it could be the end of human civilization in the next 100 years. Uh, it just, it shows us that we are, we are embodied and uh, as physical beings, like we are, we are vulnerable to outside forces at all times. We're extremely fragile. We live within this fragile balance, and and uh, so that's 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 very humbling. That's a very humbling realization. It it helps us to understand understand our shared vulner vulnerability with with all life on Earth, and. Uh, and see, see ourselves as, as something that has to be maintained in, or, in order to, to flourish this delicate balance and, and that like we don't have rights to, to extra human nature as something that can be exploited for our own gain. Yeah. For 
Howard also talked about uh, Eros and Thanatos, the drive to, to continue one's life and the death drive in uh, civilization and its discontents, and he sees human civilization as a battle between those two impulses. And oftentimes in our own history, instead of, instead of uh, progressing morally or rationally, we've, we've moved towards our own self-destruction, and I think that's explicitly what we're seeing right now with climate change, and uh, how we handle this awaits to be seen. Yeah, so it's uh, 8.20 now, and I think I'll stop and open this up to questions. Thank you so much. I'll be, the, I'll be the voice behind the uh, yeah, um, um, the, <laughs> yeah, um, um, you, you were arguing that the, the, the means, the tactics that activists take in regards to this issue, and I, I guess you'd expand it to any issue, um, should be consonant with the ends they're trying to achieve. So if they're trying to uh, bring about a um, peaceful society, their means should also be peaceful. They're trying to create a society in which human life, for example, is, res is respected, yes. if, in which there's a sanctity of life, and they shouldn't achieve that by taking life. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if um, whether the means and the ends accord is partly uh, uh, depending on how you describe the means. So there's one way of describing right, the means, which make it make them sound consonant with the end, and there's another way of describing the very same means that make them sound um, um, inconsistent with the end. So, so for example, uh, take the Hitler scenario, mm -hmm. you know, do we, we've got the gun, we can kill, take out Hitler <laughs> to achieve a peaceful World War II list society, do we yeah. do it? Uh, well, one way of describing what we're doing there is taking human life to bring about an end of Preventing peaceful, the yeah, 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 human yeah, lives. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what are we doing there? Are we killing to bring about non-killing, or are we preventing his non-killing to bring about more non-killing? And then you can you can argue that way with the animal issue too. For example, I mean, uh, um, you know, are we um, killing slaughterhouse workers or carnists? Should it come to that? Um, hunting down the last remaining carnists. Uh, are we, when we're hunting down the last remaining, the nine percent of humanity is still carnist. We're hun hunting them down and killing them before they can kill other animals. Are we killing to inconsistently bring about a uh, peaceful society, or are we trying to institute peace here by preventing their slaughtering of rabbits and deer and cows? The last few remaining carnists. What's that? The last few remaining carnists. I said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so in a way, in a way, what we're doing there is we're we're forcibly. <laughs> Achieving peace Forcibly. quite consistently with with the peace we want, right? right? But it is inconsistent because there's still a contradicted a contradiction embedded in it because uh, we because we don't like I don't know because like in this post-apocalyptic world, the last five carnists are hunting rabbits and deer and so on, and uh, the the vegans kill the carnists because they want to save the rabbits and deer. Sure. And so on. Yeah, that's absolutely but, consistent, right? But their their goal is of saving those lives, but they're hunting some lives to prevent other lives from being hunted. Oh, this so. is where my this, this is good. This is where my point about how, depending on how you describe what they're doing, it becomes either consistent or inconsistent with the end they're trying to achieve, right? So another way of describing what they're doing is saving the lives of the rabbits that would otherwise be killed. And we could we could alternately say. Um, to the one who, who says, no, no, Gandhian-like, um, we will not kill the carnists, even as in front of us they're ripping, you know, my pet rabbit to pieces because they don't think it's a pet, they think it's food. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can say, what was wrong with you, you know? What was wrong with you for not stopping them, right? So we're preventing uh -huh. violence. If, so, you know, there's a way of framing the action, saying to the carnist, look, I don't want to hurt you. My aim is not to hurt you, but I will stop you from doing violence to these animals I consider my friends, oh, there you go, I've got to reach in now and stop you, right? And so that's perfectly consistent by that description with the peaceful world we're trying to achieve. And why can't that apply to so many different peace-based movements? A lot of complicated issues come up with this, like especially with 
with regards to climate change because some some would argue that nonviolent direct action is actually a, a class privilege, like that Gandhian tactic is, is actually a class privilege because uh, in in other parts of the world in which uh, liberal democracy doesn't exist, and and often that would be in the global south, so in the parts of the world most badly affected by climate change, uh, people. Uh, people wouldn't be able to use nonviolent tactics because if they protested in nonviolent ways, they might lose their lives. Uh, from a purely Gandhian approach, like the idea is that, so what, you become a, you become a martyr and you should be willing to, to martyr yourself, but that's not a sacrifice that many of us can be expected to make. Yeah, but in response to the who would have stopped Hitler argument, uh, you can see that during that period, like, there were people who tried to make change in nonviolent ways, and, and arguably, if more people had noticed earlier on, and there had been more, more resistance, like, he could have been stopped nonviolently. We have to, we have to remember that he didn't come to power in a vacuum, and that he did come to power partly because the ideas he espoused were uncritically accepted by many Europeans at the time. Anti-Semitism was rampant in Europe at the time, and many people did not question that. That's why, I, I mean, I don't want to paint uh, everyone in Europe at the time with the same brush, but I mean, that's why a lot of people didn't complain when their Jewish brothers and sisters were being gassed. But once Hitler's in power and, and has has power and is doing violence, then then the nonviolent option is no longer on the table, right? They had the opportunity to bomb Auschwitz, but they didn't. To bomb Auschwitz? Uh, they, they did. They did. Yeah. The, the Allies had that opportunity, oh, yeah. but they, yeah. they avoided it yeah. completely. Yeah. Because because some would argue that like even though people in the camp would have been killed, like if you destroy the killing apparatus, then then like that's that's a that's a greater good, and uh, mm -hmm. if some people die, then that's a sacrifice to a much that's a sacrifice to to a much better end. There's also, I think, a distinction to be made, and like a complicated issue is when we look at property destruction. Is property destruction justified? Because some some would argue that I mean, like it's less less of a moral dilemma than taking the life of a person or taking the life of an animal. Uh, some, I mean, if we if we think, I think, I sometimes I think about like how if we think that uh, some laws shouldn't be respected because they are evil, then maybe some, even though it's against the law to destroy property, some pieces of property don't deserve to be respected because they exist for evil purposes. However, the issue with that is how quickly we get into a warlike situation, which is, which is against what we want. Like, often we, often I think that, uh, we devalue the, the idea that we can get gains through non nonviolent means. Uh, if you look at the 20th century, like a lot of enormous gains have been made when people actually got out into the streets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not an either or thing, right? Like bo both, both maybe are needed. Um, yeah. But um, but I think Bernard had a. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. The third sentence here reads, it makes no sense to save future generations by putting those who are currently alive at risk when non-risk alternatives exist. And it seems awfully convenient to this moral law that non-risk alternatives exist. And I mean, reading reading the fourth part, and reading the fourth part, it seems like this moral law implies simply that um, if we have to risk, to risk arming, um, people currently exist to save all future generations that would be permissible and we should simply accept, accept that we will all die instead. Um, if, if and if, say, uh, the, the cause of the problem were not technological in nature, but if it were, say, um, um, the sum or some cyclical thing of nature as some climate change deniers have claimed, then um, then the solution, would, the solution would necessarily be technological. In this case, how would this, uh, how would this moral apply? Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? So, well, I mean, this is more of an addendum, but suppose that the, the source of the problem were natural as opposed to technological, then um, 
the, this IAS UIS solution will very quickly necessarily be technological itself and might involve risk. When in that kind of situation, would in this moral law simply imply that again we should accept that we'll die and not and not try to save future generations? Well, well, like I think, I think that the idea that that it's a choice between. That I I think. Well, I, I think that that idea that it's a choice between uh, taking up uh, technological solutions, for example, and all of us dying, I think I think that is in part is a bit ideological. Like, I think that's what some people would like to have us believe, uh, but that ties into the idea that there is no alternative to the. I mean, technological. The, the idea that we all we have is technological solutions. Like, it's extremely pessimistic because it's basically stating flat out that we might as well embrace these bland band aid solutions because there is no no alternative to to the system that we already have in place. That we can't imagine of anything else. A complete failure of imagination. So, so I think that's a bit ideological. Uh, I mean, et ethical change on a wide scale is possible, I would like to believe. However, some would argue that in the state we're already in, like we might have no choice but to embrace technological solutions in order to save the vast majority of life and to save ourselves. However, like if you... However, however like if you... Uh, or a pure deontological thinker, and going back to the scenario of being in the death camp, uh, say you could be complicit in murder in order to save yourself some time, possibly save your spouse and children. So, so it, so it's permissible to do evil things to buy yourself some time. Like, would that not be comparable to us trying to buy our time by? By taking life, by by doing by doing things that are morally questionable, the idea is to go out with dignity, basically. Anybody uh, else? I was interested in the, the idea of how the monetization and commodification of life itself, really, especially non-human life, well, but even human life, in terms of valuing some labor more than others and valuing some lives more than others and, and externalizing all costs, if that isn't a kind of universal feature of almost any monetary system, whether it's socialism or, you know, f more farther right, further left, we suppose that the things that are further t towards the left of the spectrum are, are, are less unequal and therefore less harm is done but even, even in, in socialist societies, you can see widespread animal abuse uh, and, I mean, I mean animal, uh, animals, still, speciesism is terrible, and even in Scandinavia and places that we can think of as less unequal society. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you've considered uh, something uh, like the Futurists or the Zeitgeist Movement, which, which theorize that until we actually transcend money itself, uh, you know, the, the animals and the environment and ourselves, we don't actually have much of a chance. I mean, there is an interesting book by a Canadian called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism by John McMurtry, okay. which goes into great detail about how, how money itself is destroying everything, and that it's almost, a, it, it's a cancerous system that's almost out of our control as persons, as people, because it has, has found its way into every aspect of life, and it's, it's managed to, to warp our sense of, of what's valuable and what's ex external what's externalized. Uh, yes, yes, I, I think that the idea of a society without money is great. I hope that can be achieved eventually one day. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think that there's a lot of truth to that because, I, I think, I think that's a lot of truth to that because, like, the idea of, like, converting, like, a living thing into money I mean that's not that that is basically like seeing something as a some someone or as a means to an end, and yeah, I mean uh, Marx is very utilitarian. 
<laughs> and it's thought like that's how he justifies the idea of a proletarian uprising, for example. But also, if you look at some parts of Marx, it's actually very Kantian. It's actually he actually does have elements of that type of thinking in there, especially the idea that I mean, he doesn't extend it to animals, but that other human beings shouldn't be used as a means to an end. Because I mean, this was this was a. Uh, this was uh, over a century ago, and he states that that the workers themselves are reduced to commodities. The worker becomes a machine, while the machine gets smarter. Uh, the machine is uh, given a personality, a kind of autonomy, a kind of individuality that the human being is deprived of, and the same with commodities. The whole idea of the fetishism of the commodity, like the the commodity, is given a kind of soul that the human being no longer has. So, so like there is, there's a lot in there, and I think there are elements of that that idea that he, that other people like should not be used as a means to an end. And I think that can be extended to animals as well in there. But yeah, but I think that the idea of a money-free society, I think, I think that would be an ideal. I, I mean, like when you asked that question, it reminded me of how like some of the earliest coins we've seen, like from Sumeria, for example, are stamped with images of animals. Like that's, I mean, this was before like this cancer stage of capitalism. That was before capitalism ever existed, and we already see the roots of that kind of thinking. Uh, nature being reduced as to a, as a means to an end, and uh, the commodification of of other beings uh, that they can be bought and sold. Well, capitalism does it come from capita, head of cattle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that, but I think that's so. Really I think true. It, it came down to herding cultures and the yeah. commodification of animals, and then the translation yeah. of animal images into money. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, precisely. I mean, like some say that like the worst disaster was when we domesticated other, uh, when we d domesticated other animals and we domesticated plants. That was the beginning of this idea that we can use non-human nature as a means to earn our end. I mean, some instrumental uses of nature are, are unavoidable. I mean, we have to in order to survive, but the degree to which that's transformed, that's it's completely extreme. Yes, Elaine? So, um, obviously you're not a fan of capitalism, but can this climate vegan thing work with capitalism, or do you see it as something that oh, yeah, that's a, that's a, needs to go for it to work? No, that's it. An important question because, like, some have joked that uh, so, some have joked that the one good thing about capitalism is that it might turn everyone vegan. Because uh, Bill Gates, for example, he's put tons of money into Beyond Meat. We're we're now seeing these really realistic simulacra of meat and animal products, and like the hope is that those will flood the market and they'll face out the real thing. So, in some ways, it, capitalism can be seen as good for the animals, and uh, some people like think that maybe capitalism will end uh, the exploitation of animals for human use. Uh, last semester, we had Daniel Cooley talk, and he, he, he espoused that idea. However, the, the opposite side of that would be uh, a lot of uh, socialists who are pro-animal rights uh, would argue that even though we've seen the market flooded with all these alternatives to meat and animal products, uh, the animal industry isn't showing very many, very many signs of slowing down at all. Uh, the so, milk industry has. Yeah, like there's there's the milk industry, but for the large part, uh, something that consumer-based solutions aren't it should, it aren't the focus because uh, be, be, because. Uh, I mean, you can go into a grocery store and there's vegan products along alongside uh, oppre oppression being sold, and uh, I mean, a lot of vegan products are owned by uh, companies that also that also uh, are in the animal product business. So, like, I, I think that uh, activism definitely has to go beyond con consumer solutions like that to make to make progress, but but at the same time, like, there's an argument in there. But also, but also, like I'm, like well, well, I I think that what's happening to the milk industry, I think that's great. But at the at the same time, uh, we have to realize that capitalism doesn't necessarily reward ethical businesses or products. 
I think that like the patterns we've seen in this past century show that that clearly that clearly uh, what's ethical isn't necessarily rewarded by capitalism. I, I mean, if that were the case, then uh, renewable energy companies uh, would be would be raking in tons of money, and uh, oil would be on its way out. But clearly, the, the fossil fuel companies are incredibly determined to, to go to that last drop, uh, no matter no matter how extreme uh, the efforts to get it are. And also, there's uh, another another issue involved is that we have to look at the oppression of the human beings who are, who are making who are making the food. So, okay, let's say like we have a capitalist world in which everyone's vegan, like this vegan capitalist world, but then. Uh, in a pair, like let's say animal use has been phased out, like because it's not profitable anymore, it's not profitable anymore because of the climate and uh, the world is vegan. But at the same time, uh, if we we still live in this under this paradigm that sees that sees other human beings and other animals like primarily as a means to an end, and uh, and uh, this idea that that humans are basically commodities isn't challenged, then. Like we can have all these vegan products, but I mean, if the the people who make them are like are uh, completely exploited, and and if they and and uh, if they they work in abominable conditions, then then is that a vegan world? Paul, did you have another question? Well, I was just thinking that, that in fact, uh, problems are very often the most profitable things. I mean, pollution leads to bottled water industry, disease leads to treatment industries, and, they're, and they all seem to be so connected. Uh, I'm thinking maybe the good news is that, that, there, that there really may be, if not a, a dramatic instant collapse, uh, a long-term collapse that will, that will force us to transition into other modes uh, of, of relating to each other as a society and as a... Yeah, yeah, long-term collapse. Like this relates to the, the issues I've been speaking about as well. Because uh, Kant, in his famous essay, in answer to the question "What is enlightenment?", he rejected the idea of a revolution, and he said that gradual reform is important, and gradual reform is in, within the system, within the structures of the system, are what we have to work on, not abolishing those structures necessarily. And uh, yeah, and like it. I mean, there are positives to that. It's a lot more peaceful than a violent uprising, and uh, it's preferable to a violent uprising in many ways. But then at this, but then at the same time, the issue is that, I mean, considering the severity of this situation, do we have that time for gradual reform? A lot of people we would say we don't. Uh, I don't think that rebel, an uprising necessarily has to be violent, but I, I think that. Yeah, but I but I think that we may be, I I, I mean, like, I think we are running out of time. Well, look, look historically, how many violent uh, uprisings and revolutions were fomented by deliberate economic hardships imposed on societies and cultures mm -hmm. by central banks and other behind the scenes interests, and how that continues to play out as the profitable war industry, uh, how these these situations are exploited, and people are sacrificed and, and, and environments and, uh, and animals to this uh, capitalist uh, concept you know, of uh, depredation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you're talking about disaster capitalism, which Naomi Klein talks about in her book The Shock Doctrine. And uh, the disturbing thing is that we're already seeing that a lot with climate change. Like there have been talks about uh, when the polar ice melts, having uh, trade routes uh, through the Northwest Passage because it'll be completely watered by that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, also the idea like it's it's just terrible and ridiculous. Like the idea that we should start digging for oil under the the Arctic o Arctic Ocean because it's going to be opened up because there's no ice and uh, it's a it's a way for basically uh, multinational corporations and uh, the military industrial complex to suck up the money by by totally exploiting catastrophes. Are there any other questions? All right, well, uh should we wrap up then? Yeah, yeah, should we? Okay. Should I, should I wrap you up?
Oh, right. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Did you want to add anything? Uh, did, did I want to add anything right yeah. now? Uh, About next week or other things? Oh, oh next week? Oh, next week, yeah. Next week, uh... uh